Welcome to this latest episode from Union Solidarity International. Today we are talking to the very esteemed and very knowledgeable and high profile Kostas Lapovitsis, who's going to give us his analysis on the current situation, particularly within Greece and in the Eurozone. Kostas, it's an absolute delight to have you with us today, my friend. And I understand that you've just been in back home in Thessalonica at the weekend. Tell me, Kostas, what is the current situation in Greece from your perspective? First of all, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, I was in uh, Salonika, I was also in Athens for a couple of weeks. So um, I've had the opportunity to see things from uh, close quarters. I, I also did some public speaking there and I met a lot of uh, people. Uh, I can tell you that um, the situation in um, economic and uh, social terms is going from bad to worse. Um, it's very uh, evident. Uh, you can see signs of um, profound economic and social crisis um, wherever you turn. Unemployment is going through the roof. You see signs of uh, extreme poverty, homelessness, uh, inability of people to meet um, their uh, food needs, uh, and so on. It's apparent. It, it, there are elements of a humanitarian crisis uh, in the large urban center uh, emerging uh, daily. Uh, so that's very bad. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, political uh, developments and so on, uh, the government, um, uh, three-party government uh, in power at the moment uh, is um, four square uh, for the um, Troika program. Uh, it's applying the um, measures of austerity, liberalization and privatization across the board. Um, and it is doing so uh, in an increasingly authoritarian, conservative, and um, aggressive way. Um, among the people, you see uh, an element of um, uh, hopelessness, helplessness, uh, and uh, profound anger. There's a sense of anger piling up uh, everywhere that's not being um, uh, expressed openly uh, or, or, or confidently uh, any longer. Thanks very much, Costas, for that introductory comments. I'm fascinated, Costas, by what has been described in other places as a paralysis of the political situation. I don't know if it is a paralysis because there seems to be an agenda that is being driven. I don't know what is, what is paralysed about that. And that in Greece, how do we break out of the the three parties that are in government who are wedded to the Troika's program. What is the political situation that can, and the dynamics that can help break away from this continual downward spiral? Because it's very difficult to see how a part a party that is opposed to austerity, and of course we're not talking about the Nazis and Golden Dawn, but a, a party that is against austerity that can actually come and make legislative moves to break the downward spiral? Technically, or I mean, in a narrow sense, of course, if a party was of this type was elected to power, it would have uh, ample opportunity to bring in all sorts of measures and uh, enact them and begin to turn the situation around. It is perfectly feasible. The real question is, what will bring this about? Yes. Now, Things, as I mentioned, you have become worse and worse, uh, unfortunately, the last few months. There's an element of um, uh, hopelessness and uh, frustration among people. I see two factors that could potentially change the situation uh, at the moment. Uh, domestically, uh, what, we, what might change the situation would be simply a blind explosion. Uh, unfortunately, we're heading that way. Yeah. Uh, now, a blind explosion can never be predicted. I can't tell you when it might happen, but I can tell you that, I, that the elements that make for it are there. The, the, the situation is, is simply incendiary uh, in Athens uh, and elsewhere. I can't tell you, I repeat, when it might happen, uh, but the elements that uh, make for it are definitely present. And uh, it could well be blind, as I said, it could well be uh, mindless, it could well be simply 
anger venting itself um, left, right, and center. And that, so that would probably change the political situation if it happened. Yeah. Not necessarily in a positive way, but it would certainly change the political situation. The other thing that might change the political situation in Greece would be external pressure, ex external events, um, such as what happened in Italy. Um, if this kind of um, political earthquake uh, occurred elsewhere, and if it uh, became bigger and bigger elsewhere in the Eurozone, then Greece uh, would also be dragged along. Um, that is also possible because the situation, the situation in Europe is becoming uh, untenable by the day. Um, uh, austerity doesn't work, uh, people, pe the people of Europe um, are not really ready to put up with it for much longer, uh, something is going to happen, everybody knows that something is going to happen in Europe. Now that might uh, drag Greece along. Uh, essentially, then, what I'm telling you is that there is a sense of political immobility in Greece. That the political parties seem to have seem to have exhausted their dynamism, and they're waiting for something to happen, uh, either in society, blind and angry, or outside, uh, that will also drag Greece along. Okay, thanks for that fascinating analysis. I mean, Greece has been compared to the beginning of the end of the Weimar Republic. I'm sure you've probably seen some of the writings by Paul Mason and other people. Is the situation in your opinion, Costas, as volatile as the beginning of the end of the Weimar Republic? Are, is Greece entering a social situation because of the, the economic collapse and the social collapse in that country? Is it fair and accurate to say that we are at the beginning of the end of the Weimar Republic, there are similar conditions? Um, you know, historical analogies are dangerous and yeah. uh, strange things. Right? How far back do you go and what do you use to uh, create an analogy? And in any case, history never repeats itself uh, in exactly the same way. Uh, so we start with that. Now, is the Weimar Republic the right analogy? Well, maybe in Greece, and I'll come to it in a minute, but when you look at Europe uh, more generally, I think the analogy that I would find most useful is actually before, earlier than that. It would be in the middle of the 19th century, it would be the 1848 revolutions, yeah. um, when Europe suddenly ignited, uh, there were political revolutions across the board, political regimes changed, uh, and one country uh, affected uh, another, and the whole of Europe was transformed. I think that's what it looks like to me. Um, uh, I repeat, a political revolution. Um, I don't think the peoples of Europe are ready for a social or an economic revolution, let me put it that way. I don't see the forces that are confident for this, that are pushing for it, that have got a plan for it. But I do see enormous political anger uh, accumulating and uh, present across Europe, yeah. including, including in Britain. Britain is not any different in that respect. There's a sense uh, of um, detachment of the ruling elite, that these people are imposing austerity, they're imposing, uh, they're imposing old-fashioned and, and, and bankrupt uh, measures of privatization, liberalization, the market, and, and, and so on. Uh, and people are not prepared to accept that. And the, the, the response tends to be political rejection. If you read, if you look at the Italian uh, outcome, that's basically what it is: that the Italians have rejected the political regime, they have rejected the euro and and everything it stands for, if it destroys their livelihood, and they're prepared to say, "Out with the old politics. We need new politics." Now, the economic and social content of that is not that clear, but the political content is very clear, and I think you find that across Europe that uh, the Spaniards. Um, the British, Portuguese, the Portuguese, you know, they want political change. And you know, once these things start, uh, they infect, uh, one country infects another. That's how Europe is. So that's why I'm saying it looks to me, the situation looks to me uh, similar to uh, 1848. And that's what, that's what, well, what we might be heading uh, towards. Now, within that, Greece is ahead and also a special case because of the, of the depth of the crisis and because of the rise of outright fascism, which we haven't actually seen elsewhere, except Hungary, where we do have uh, fascism. Um, now, Greece is indeed um, 
uh, at a very dangerous moment of its history. Uh, within that broad European uh, situation of unrest and instability, Greece is particularly profound, particularly bad. Um, it isn't just the depth of the crisis, it isn't just the depth of the social disaster, it's also that there are no prospects of, um, of recovery that are persuasive. That there's no hope, and hopelessness is always a very bad guide. So, Greece is bad, yes, very bad. Um, uh, the things that are likely to happen uh, will, uh, will probably be quite extreme, um, either on the left or on the right. It will be the left and the right that will, that will fight it out, I think, in the coming period against the situation of social uh, disillusionment and social frustration. Yeah. Costas, that's an absolutely fascinating response. And, you know, thinking back to the readings and the history of 1848, I can see how your analogy would be more apt for Greece to to give a comparison of 1848. I would also like to ask you, Costas, about your position. You've been very vocal on your belief that for Greece to have some semblance of economic recovery, it would have to exit from the euro. Is that still your position? And if you give us a short explanation, I know it's a very complicated issue, but a short explanation of why you believe that Greece leaving the euro is, is, can help lead it to the path of economic recovery. I would start by saying that by now it's evident that the euro has failed generally, not just in Greece. It's perfectly clear that the monetary union is uh, the prime cause of um, the economic malfunctioning of Spain, of Portugal, and increasingly of other countries in Europe, Italy, uh, and increasingly France. Uh, the, 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 this monetary union that has been created by the forces of capital and by the forces of uh, the rich uh, in Europe has created the situation in which the working people and the poor uh, are confronted with increasingly impossible conditions uh, of existence, austerity uh, and, and crushed wages and so on. It's perfectly clear. The euro works, uh, keeping the proportions, similar to how the old gold standard used to work, uh, blind, automatic, and uh, destroying the livelihood of working people. Uh, it's untenable. It, can, it cannot survive in the way in which uh, it is formed at the moment, and my view is that it will not survive, and uh, it isn't just Greece, it's also the other countries. Now, once again, within that, Greece is, um, in a sense, ahead of the pack, yeah. uh, under the heaviest uh, pressure, although Portugal and other countries uh, are following close uh, at the moment. Um, in my view, Greece has got no future within the monetary union. The only future it has is a future of um, poverty, um, weak and unstable growth, uh, migration of its uh, young people to find employment abroad, um, a troubled, unequal uh, and impoverished uh, society. It needs to make a break. It would have been a lot easier three years ago because its debt was smaller, the economy was not destroyed, um, it had bargaining chips, uh, but the ruling uh, elite in Greece chose to keep the country in at enormous cost uh, and without really solving the problem of the crisis. So the issue is still there. Greece must get out, in my view, and in all probability Greece will get out. Unfortunately, it looks as if it's going to get out uh, at the end of some kind of blind crisis. Um, even so, um, the left or some progressive forces will have to pick up the pieces and start putting the economy back on its feet. Um, they will have to bring capital controls, they will have to uh, nationalize and control the banks, they will have to do something about um, wages and pensions, raise them, uh, and they would have to put in place industrial policy uh, with the aim of increasing employment and of creating uh, new development fields uh, so that the real economy uh, begins to grow again and begins to expand again to provide uh, employment and incomes uh, for working people and broader uh, strata in Greece. It's perfectly feasible uh, and I think it, it really is the only option for growth uh, in the country in the years to come. Thanks for that response, Costas. I just want to ask you one last question and really 
it's something that we briefly touched on, and I know you visited the factory in Thessalonica and the Vio May workers, and you know just your views and what an inspiring example of workers occupying a factory and trying to put in place a business plan that will be productive, efficient, and also profitable. And the workers, of course, have found themselves in this situation through no fault of their own. Do you want to just, in a couple of words, give your views on how inspiring the Viome workers are and why we need to support them? I think it's a very, very important um, event and a very, very important struggle. It's been going on for months. These people have uh, been through um, great difficulties and through their own efforts and through their own basic solidarity, you know, classic worker solidarity, um, they've managed to pull something out of the fire, basically. They've managed to, to, to rescue something out of a situation that was terrible for them. And they've got to be applauded simply for that, uh, taking charge of their own uh, lives to a certain extent and refusing to accept defeat and destruction and employment and the loss uh, of their wages, uh, wages for a long period of time, which they, they haven't been paid. Um, now, they want to uh, go down the path of managing the, uh, the factory, ensuring that they've got the capacity, the know-how and the skills to do so without um, the employer, without the boss, basically, who, who, has, been, who has been defrauding them of their, of their monies. Um, that again should be applauded because it's good for their own particular case, but it also sets an example um, across the country, uh, which is facing closures and unemployment uh, and a destruction of its uh, productive structure. Uh, so they should be supported. They should be supported um, by trade unions, by trade unionists, by cooperative banks, by all associational and cooperative forces. Um, across other countries and other societies because that's what we've got here. We've got an associational and cooperative way of dealing with crisis and that's what we want to see, that's what we want, what we want to strengthen uh, and we need to support it uh, four square. Now, in my view, having visited the, the, the plant and, and spoken to these um, workers, I believe that they have got the know-how and the fundamental understanding to run the business. That's not that unusual, as you know. Workers do know where they work and they do understand the business perfectly well. It's usually the bosses who want to make out <laughs> that workers haven't got that knowledge. Actually, in practice, they do. So they do know how to run the business, I think. Uh, they do have a good understanding of it, but of course, they need liquid resources, they need money, and they need to begin to, to operate it in a way that is um, self-sustaining. This depends on factors and elements which are beyond them. Uh, they have to be negotiated. It depends on banks, it depends on the law, it depends on all sorts of things. But they're taking very good steps uh, to deal with all that. Um, they know what the difficulties are, they know what their strengths are, and they know increasingly where their friends are. Uh, and they need friends. They need friends across the board, they need friends internationally. Uh, so I'm delighted to have, to, to have had the opportunity to talk to you about this, because obviously British workers and other workers across the world um, should support them and uh, should show solidarity towards them. Costas, that's an absolutely perfect point to end our web chat with you today. It only leaves me to thank you for a very illuminating and insightful conversation as always and we look forward to trade unionists and progressives who are watching this or listening to this on iTunes to visit the Viome Workers website and get involved and try and give liquid financial support to the workers so they can put in place a business plan. And we look forward uh, in Union Solidarity International to speaking again with you in the future, comrade. It's been an absolute pleasure. Many thanks, Andrew. The pleasure is all mine. I look forward to talking to you again in the future.